the book launch of Dr. Rosita Amitaj. Dr. Amitaj is an anthropo uh, anthropologist, policy advisor, and governance specialist working in Asia for over two decades. She has lived in Pakistan for several years, and she's currently advising the Australian government in Cambodia. Uh, she holds a PhD in political anthropology from the Australian National University and a degree in Arab and Islamic studies. In today's talk, she'll discuss her book, Big Capital in an Unequal World, The Micropolitics of Wealth in Pakistan. And I'm really excited to have her here because most of you have already reviewed this book. So we're expecting a very lively audience full of questions. The book, for those of you who have not read it yet, the book examines the networks, uh, social practices and marriages of the elite in Pakistan. And in doing so, it explores the ways in which the elites, elite builds and sustains uh, power and inequality. The book draws on 14 months of ethnographic study with elite business persons, politicians, their families, senior bureaucrats, who <laughs> had a little bit of a talk about bureaucrats being elites or not, and regulators in Pakistan. The book was recently published in February 2023 by Liberty Books, Dr. Amitaj. Thank you so much, Dr. Mariam. Um, Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you so much for, for coming to this conversation. Um, let me see if this is working. Let me know if you can't hear me well, um, and we'll see if we can change the microphone. I'm not sure if it's amplifying. Ah, okay. But today I am going to talk about how wealth and power is captured and guarded. And I'm going to begin to answer the question of why does economic and social inequality persist to such a great extent in so many parts of the world? And I look at this question through the lens of Pakistan. I argue that we cannot seek to understand social and economic inequality without understanding the lives of the top 1% of wealth owners and the histories, relationships, negotiations and conflicts that have caused this group of the social strata to amass enormous wealth and privilege, while broad swathes of the general population continue to suffer. As I will discuss in the next 40 minutes or so, the strategies elite use to acquire wealth and to maintain it differ. A precondition of acquiring wealth is opportunity, and the primary strategies used to maintain wealth are the cultivation of tightly restricted and guarded social networks, engaging in strategic alliance making through uh, through uh, um, elite families through marriage, and seeking exemption from the laws and regulations of the nation. My talk today focuses on how Pakistan's elite enact these strategies. But first, who are the elites? Elites can be defined in many ways, as we've had some conversations about. I define the Pakistani elite as those belonging to the families who generate at least US $100 million in revenue per year, the economic and political 1%. The families included as the focus of my research owned the nation's major industrial and business assets, but most were also part of extended families with a major role in national or provincial politics. And they also had very close ties to senior most ranks of Pakistan's very powerful military establishment. Consequently, though all my informants were businessmen and in a few instances women, Many were also prominent politicians or the sons or nephews of po prominent politicians. Many were also the sons or daughters of now retired brigadiers and generals. And though many claimed to be apolitical, all had fostered close relationships with senior members of the bureaucracy. Most of the elite have derived the largest proportion of their profits from large scale industrial projects or in manufacturing. And the enormous profits that have been generated emerged from the opportunities inherent in the classic industrializing society, where workers' salaries and political representation are commensurately low. In achieving their high levels of profits, many have focused on providing commodities to the domestic markets, market or on producing high demand export commodities for which they hold monopoly or equivalent advantage in the world market. The disparities in wealth that have emerged in pursuing these forms of economic growth are astounding. So drawing on 14 months of ethnographic fieldwork with Pakistan's urban elite in Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad, 
and the work of previous research on class inequality, power and politics. I will examine the factors required in acquiring and maintaining wealth and how they have been used to prevent them being redistributed to the benefit of the broader population. So until recently, class and class relations had been out of fashion as a means for examining and explaining social, political and economic inequality. Starting from the 1980s and the decline of the industrial working class in the West, class began to be used much less frequently to explain other aspects of social organisation, including relations of power, wealth, kinship, gender and ethnicity. There was a growing sense that class had been transcended. Others argued that earlier class divisions had been subsumed in an ever-expanding middle class, suspended between a small group of the poor and a tiny group of super-rich. In the context of this large and amorphous middle class, many felt that analyses of class relations were no longer relevant to understanding processes of power, development and social inequality. And some scholars went so far as to argue that class is dead. South Asia scholars further argue that the concept of class reflects a Western-centric view of the world that was unsuited to South Asia. The Indian scholar Chakrabarti argued that traditional Marxist class analysis was inappropriate for understanding power and inequality in India and by extension across South Asia. Instead of examining the structural inequalities that characterized Indian society, Chakrabarti identified Indian culture and the colonial legacy as the root causes of India's poverty at the time, inequality and economic underdevelopment, arguing that in India, hierarchy and the violence that sustains it remains the dominant organizing principles in everyday life. The enormous public interest that emerged following Thomas Piketty's 2014 analysis of global wealth inequality demonstrated the renewed public appetite for examining the relationship of class to wealth inequality. His research highlighted the crucial role that inheritance from parents to children plays in achieving and amassing high levels of wealth and the accumulative advantage and disadvantage this generates. Once more placing family and kinship relations at the center of discussions of wealth inequality. And this is a point on which we agree. Traditionally, the scholarship on elites has been divided by those who follow a Marxist understanding, defining groups in relation to their role to the means of production and the social dominance or subordination this relationship determines and those who follow a Weberian definition of status groups, which conceptualize elites as defined by the power and resources they possess. Both groups agree that elites are a group possessing power and resources, authority over others, and that they occupy the apex of the social hierarchy. Detailed descriptions of who the elite are have also varied widely. widely. Sociologists have tended to reduce class to a set of indicators based on income, ownership, debt, and consumption. And other scholars have focused more on class consciousness, shared class opposition to others, and the way that people self-identify. But across disciplines, elites are widely mischaracterized as a monolith, as the bearers of injustice, and as a faceless, self-serving, venal and corrupt group who actively seek to undermine all reforms they view as opposed to their own interests. At their most simple, elites are those who are able to realize their will even if others resist it. And elites make many people very uneasy. They are uncomfortable with their casual privilege and even more disturbingly, so little is known about them and about the way that they live their lives. My research and my new book looks underneath the cover to see how elites in Pakistan have emerged, how their behaviours enable them to accumulate wealth and power, and how these actions perpetuate inequality. It also humanises this group, revealing the personal ways that power is exercised in practice. So I'll now turn to the defining features of the acquisition of wealth in Pakistan, uh, instability and conflict. In most countries, the accumulation of wealth is at least in part closely intertwined with the activities and policies of the government. 
In countries like Pakistan, the central government distributes economic privileges to shore up the political factions by which it is supported. Whether military or civilian, the desire of each government to keep itself in power has encouraged patterns of production, accumulation and consumption that tie the support of powerful local leaders, business people and their patronage networks to the political regime in power. Pakistan provides a compelling case of elite power in the contemporary capitalist world. As like many developing, as many rapidly developing nations, it is both run by an oligarchy of political and economic interests, and it is beset by high levels of political instability. This instability is largely generated by competition and conflict within the oligarchy of ruling families, as individual leaders and their families jostle for power. But for all the competition amongst the elite, the group is also tightly bound together in complex ties of marriage, friendship and mutual advantage. And there is an in tight interlinking of the business, political, bureaucratic and military spaces within these families. Despite the dramatic economic transformations that have taken place over the world in the last 80 years and the massive shifts in political leadership and social structure these changes have engendered over the same period, the Pakistani elite class has routinely fortified and reconstituted itself and the power and privilege of its members in pursuit of shared profit and market dominance. And they have been very successful. Yet the rapid economic development that has reconfigured agricultural economies in other parts of South Asia into centers of finance, global trade and professional services has not emerged in Pakistan and does not look likely in the coming decades. Pakistan's elite dominated economy demonstrates few signs of transitioning to a globalized high finance economy, nor of replicating the economic growth patterns of India or China its most stable and successful neighbors. The political infighting that defines Pakistani politics and the unwillingness of whichever government is in power to adequately invest in critical public infrastructure like quality public education has to date made this economic transition impossible. So as I said at the beginning, acquiring wealth takes opportunity. And in Pakistan's case, much of this opportunity has emerged as a result of major political and economic upheaval. If you look closely at the lineages or the family trees of Pakistan's wealthiest and most influential families, you will see that for almost all of them, their wealth was acquired during a major political crisis. Partition with India, the war between West and East Pakistan, following military coup d'etats, or in the turbulent shifts between various military and civilian governments. Many of these families also lost a great deal of their, of their wealth in these moments of crises, but through their social and marital networks, which I will come to later in this talk, they were able to rebuild. Each had extensive networks with those already in power or with those on the way up. We can see it with the jute traders who became the world suppliers of jute sandbags and experienced an economic boom during the Korean War of 1950 to 53. We see this with the Gujarati businessmen from the Indian Muslim community who Jinnah invited to develop the nation's sorely needed industry following partition. They were mainly middle class traders and through their support for a new Muslim state, their relationship with Jinnah and the enormous economic concessions provided by the new Pakistani state, they were catapulted from traders and shopkeepers to become the leaders of national industry. And we also see it with the families who transitioned from the ranks of professional soldiers to become some of the wealthiest politicians today in tandem with the rise of various military regimes. Each of these shifts propelling a family from the upper middle classes into the elites followed major political upheaval. These turbulent moments in history were exceptional times generating enormous needs that had to be filled and providing opportunities for a huge and rapid acquisition of wealth to those who were able to respond to those needs quickly. So maintaining wealth and power is another thing altogether. 
It requires constant maintenance of a closed and exclusive social network, which provides access to the forums where deals are made and policies are negotiated. A strict adherence to ensuring the marriages of one's children are strategic and provide solid permanent bonds between families with complementary forms of power and the creation of what I term a culture of exemptions. So let me now turn to the importance of maintaining a closed and tightly policed social network. Clearly, being elite is much more than the possession of wealth, capital and resources, though these are also a prerequisite for membership. My elite informants were deeply occupied with being and with being perceived to be the right sort of people. Beyond business skill, business political acumen and intra-elite networking, the power of elites, regardless of when their wealth was acquired, is at least partly located in their ability to acquire and demonstrate distinction and other forms of symbolic capital. Until recently, the group I call established elites have primarily drawn their claims for distinction from hereditary sources. These claims depend largely upon family lineages intertwined with British colonial power. The domination and subjugation that English colonization exerted on Indian society also did not include the Indian upper classes, nobility, royalty, or business moguls. While colonization involved explicit coercion against the Indian masses, its oppression often took more subtle forms of symbolic violence when levied against the Indian elite. Elite Indians were to serve as an intermediary class, representing and administering British interests, whilst shielding the British rulers from the majority of the population and the Indian cultures that they represented. Elite Indians associated with the British regimes were often provided with land, cash payments, and the bestowal of official titles to guarantee their support for the colonial regime through their leadership in local forums. These inducements could not, however, fully disguise the transition of many of these leaders into largely powerless agents of the British and implementers of their colonial objectives. So Britain's occupation and domination over the people of undivided India brought with it very specific notions of high culture and a set of exclusive institutions designed to keep Indians out and to protect and preserve appropriate forms of British high culture. These institutions catered firstly to the desire of many colonizers to separate themselves from Indian society, and secondly, the need to create a class of Indians who would help the British expand and govern their empire, as exemplified in the British-run schools established for the Indian elite class. Over time, the types of distinction favoured by the British, along with many of their dispositions, became part of the lived experience and culture of the Indian elite. But like all social classes, however, the Pakistani elite continues to evolve, with new groups of wealthy emerging to contest the upper echelons of political power and cultural authority. The Pakistani elite differentiate between old money and new money in ways that do not necessarily correlate with the length of time a person has held their wealth. As each new privileged group emerges in association with various civilian and military regimes, the established elite actively attempt to exclude prospective competitors in business and other fields from the formal and informal social forums in which business and politics is largely conducted in substance. The oldest and most prestigious elite families have served as gatekeepers of various elite institutions. The private clubs, the school board of Pakistan's most exclusive boys' school, Edison College, exclusive parties, and as the arbiters of appropriate and inappropriate marriage. By gatekeeping these institutions, a small number of established families were able to ensure that those families not deemed suitable were denied entry to the social forums where decisions were made and resources were allocated, regardless of their level of wealth. The interlinking of these forms of distinction with anglicized notions of being elite is so pervasive that many of the wealthiest and most successful businessmen I came to know, whose wealth was more recently acquired, rejected the label elite altogether, 
often often citing the supposedly humble origins of their fathers or grandfathers and their regional identities as Punjabis, Pakhtuns, Sindhis or Baloch. When pressed, many of these men referred to themselves as upper middle class, feeling that the term elite implied a level of inherited privilege that would negate or underplay their own hard work in establishing their business empires that now place them in the economic 1%. These groups tended to associate their position of economic, social and political influence, not with inherited privilege, but with a host of positive moral characteristics, including integrity, hard work and determination. Along with hard work, however, the fortunes of these families were often tied to the rise of other powerful institutions in Pakistan. As largely middle-class institutions like the bureaucracy and the military expanded and consolidated their power through political rule in the decades following Pakistan's creation, they also provided patronage and opportunities for rapid upward social mobility for a small group of new families a group the established elite continuously attempts to exclude with varying degrees of success. For instance, the families who transitioned into the ranks of the economic 1% through their affiliation with the regime of General Zia al-Haq from the 1980s onwards, and earlier by many accounts, became widely known by the established elite as new money, or Nave Raja in Punjabi, meaning literally new lords. Many maintained close ties with the military regime, either through personal kinship ties as the close family of senior, now retired personnel in the Zia regime, or through the maintenance of mutually beneficial business partnerships established during the military regimes of General Zia or later General Musharraf. And the established elite often pair the terms Navaraja and new money with the term Paindu, critiquing what they see to be a lack of sophistication among the new rich. The more recently a family acquired its wealth, the more negative the association of the established elite, and the more critical the descriptors are used to explain their rapid rise in wealth. The terms Navaraja, Paindu, and new money are most often applied by the established elite to families who break one of two taboos, the taboo against acquiring money rapidly and that of spending and displaying wealth in an ostentatious manner. Both of these rules replicate uh, the class structures in colonial Britain, a prohibition against attempting to rise above one's station unless undertaken discreetly and cross-generationally, a distaste for ostentation and an aversion to those who have not acquired the full range of elite dispositions. So a split emerged largely between families who had acquired their wealth prior to or in the first few decades of the new Pakistani state and the new money families who transitioned from the middle classes into the uppermost tier of wealth from the 1980s. And then a slowly emerging third category of upwardly mobile middle class families who, who are now achieving partial and at times almost complete integration with the established elite through their adherence to established elite educational values and social norms, for instance, through acquiring entrance to Etchison College. As Nave Raja elites obtained influential roles in business, politics, and the military, the established elite began to employ screening techniques that limited their access to political power and decision-making forums. The highly rigorous and also highly subjective screening processes employed at the nation's most prestigious social clubs serve to verify whether a new money elite is the right sort of person. If they're accepted at the Sindh Club, the Boat Club, or the Punjab Club, then they are. The relationship between individual elites is also critical to their wealth and power. Social relationships between elite men and women are used to reinforce their power and privilege by creating closed social spaces that are not accessible to those outside the elite. This happens in elite schools, social clubs, and in private parties. The importance of these social relationships was summed up well by one of my informants, who I call Zahir, 
the owner of one of Pakistan's major media houses. He lifted up his phone to show me his phone directory and, and proclaimed, to be successful in Pakistan, you need affluence, connections, parties, socializing. I keep a budget for entertaining and parties. I know everyone. I have all the powerful big boys on my speed dial. The prime minister, the chief minister, the head of army operations for the whole of Punjab. Anyone who is big enough has access to these devils. My family is responsible for 15% of the parties in Lahore. For those who matter, that is. It is only a handful of people who host these types of parties. All the who's who mingle at these few people's houses. There was certainly hyperbole in the bragging above. But given Zahir's economic capital, his position as son of one of the country's most well-known and widely respected Punjabi politicians, and as one of the people best positioned to shape the public national discourse through his role in the media, it was not an outlandish claim. Like most powerful Pakistanis, his power did not come only from his economic or professional position, but from the cultural capital inherited from his family and from their reputation in politics and business. And it also came from the network he actively, so he actively cultivated through socializing, hosting parties, and strategic alliance making through marriage. These cultivated relationships are then used to overcome obstacles to their business and political success. These friendships can be based either on emotion or be developed with the primary purpose of gaining access to social or political resources. Most often they are a combination of the two. The hosting and attendance of dinners, parties and events with other powerful and politically influential elites form a critical component of how elites create and strengthen relationships with other elites from across Pakistan's business, bureaucratic, military and political circles. Another of my informants was very skilled at cultivating social connections for economic advantage. He hosted regular garden parties attended by generals, members of the ISI, senior bureaucrats, journalists, any kind of person who he thought it would be helpful to know at some point in the future. He described how he would develop a party list around one or two guests who he expected to need a favour from at some point in the future. This way he had government officials and others dining at his home before he even needed to consider before they even needed to consider whether to issue him a contract to assist him with a clearance project or to assist with a security challenge. He did not see the entertaining as a bribe, but as a lure to create a debt that would need to be repaid at some point in the future. These enjoyable social activities and sharing of valuable knowledge create an inner circle of trust in which to strengthen existing friendships and cultivate new acquaintances. Like the nation's elite social clubs and schools, these forums provide an opportunity for the elite to identify one another, to reinforce social hierarchy, to share information, and to facilitate the introductions that broaden and enable political and business opportunities. The second process used to maintain and protect wealth and power is strategic family making. Kinship and family relations are central to the reproduction of elite families all over the world, not just in Pakistan. In Pakistan, where political crises have been frequent since the nation was founded, marriages increase the ability of families and individuals to adapt and to respond to rapidly changing political and economic circumstances. Marriages among the elite, as among all other classes, are used to create bonds between families and to reduce vulnerability to the threats of economic competition and reputational damage. Different families utilize different marital strategies to shore up their power and influence. Some follow various forms of cousin marriage in an effort to keep wealth within a family line and to reduce tension between family members as wealth is divided. But many other families have chosen to wed their children to families with strong military connections, given the preeminence of Pakistan's military and economic and political life. For businessmen, marrying their son to the daughter of a general is advantageous, both during the general's active life in military service 
and following his retirement. A father-in-law with close ties within the senior ranks of the military may be able to facilitate any number of advantageous military contracts, assist in solving legal disputes, and will be well-placed to make useful introductions and recommendations to others in their social circle, particularly following their retirement when the constraints imposed upon the behaviour of military personnel are considerably relaxed. I explore the role of marital bonds between families in detail in my book. And finally, we come to the culture of exemptions. An undeniable particularity of Pakistan that has enhanced the degree to which its elites can accumulate and expend political and economic power is the volatility of Pakistan's political system, the porousness of its legal and regulatory system, and its highly deregulated market, which gives largely free reign to the nation's most powerful families. <clears throat> Like the broader global elite to which they belong, Pakistan's elite have a great aptitude for navigating the restrictions of the domestic and international laws and regulations which seek to impede their ability to accumulate assets and maximize profits. The Pakistani elite both determine the political and economic structures of their country, shaping its rules, regulations, and institutional structures, and also live outside of the confines of these rules and frameworks, navigating and circumventing the laws and regulations that go against their interests. Further, their role in shaping these laws, regulations, and institutions, and undermining their impartiality and predictability has actively manufactured the social and economic inequality, which enabled them to reap enormous profits disproportionate to those accessible to the general public. My informants saw themselves as outside of and above the Pakistani class structure and outside of the laws and regulations that organize, constrain, and sometimes protect the rest of the Pakistani citizenry. Many Pakistanis of all class backgrounds observe that the law functions primarily as a political tool rather than a set of impartial guidelines and associated sanctions to protect the interests of individuals and communities. As a political tool, the law becomes something that exists to be negotiated and manoeuvred. Discussions of the extra-legal activities engaged in by the Pakistani elite were frequent with my fieldwork with businessmen, politicians, and bureaucrats. Some of their activities were illegal, but most could simply be termed extra-legal, a set of activities which are illicit and informal, as well as undeclared, unregistered, and which violate the letter of the law because they are not accountable to systems of declaration and taxation. Like the global elite of which they are a part, the Pakistani elite direct the legal and regulatory structures that determine flows of wealth and opportunity within the country, while simultaneously operating outside of and above these structures. And these aren't the findings of my research alone. The scholarship on Pakistan's business and political realm is unanimous in noting high rates of corruption and clientelism between the state and private business. Among Pakistan's elite business circles, evasion of certain laws and regulations, particularly those related to taxation, customs, production quotas, and factory compliance, are expected and openly admitted. <laughs> Though a number of Pakistani businessmen and politicians are reputed not to engage in any form of illegality, which is a point of personal pride and a notable component of their public reputation, most acknowledge the need to provide gifts or bribes to ensure that approvals from the government are granted or expedited, or to avoid taxation or export and import duties. Many elites are aware that the opportunities they gain from evading disadvantageous laws are not available to the middle and lower classes. And some even acknowledge the cumulative effect of tax evasion or minimization, cartelization and bribery, both hinders the government's provision of basic public services and increases wage pressure on those in economically precarious position through price increases. 
Despite these acknowledgements, I encountered very little condemnation within this small privileged class of the extra legal advantages available to them, nor self-reflexivity on the way that availing of these advantages strengthened and reinforced Pakistan's extreme social and economic inequality. In context with weak states and regulatory bodies, Acts which are illegal are not necessarily seen to be immoral, just as acts which are legal are not necessarily viewed as being moral. Many elite businessmen describe the appropriateness or inappropriateness of their behavior in business, as well as in their social and family lives, by whether or not it would be perceived by the public or by their elite peers as bad nami, an act that is disgraceful, dishonorable, discrediting, and entailing a loss of reputation, or as is that, an act which is honourable. In shaping their moral discourses in these terms, business elites shift their perceptions on illegality from potentially bad Nami behaviour to that which could be understood as is that. Often they did this by engaging in highly visible acts of philanthropy or religiosity, such as the Hajj. Engaging in extra legality was not seen to be intrinsically immoral or personally problematic as long as a morally sound justification could be provided. The ends justified the means. As such, the business elite circumscribed a number of laws governing business with impunity and the sense that doing so was justified and necessary to ensure they remained competitive in the marketplace. The Pakistani elite operate in a historical context of massive political and economic instability that has frequently demonstrated the state to be capricious and for its laws and regulations to be applied in ways that are highly variable and often personally vindictive. The betrayal that they had experienced at the hands of certain individuals or government regimes, the turbulence engendered by major historical events, and the oscillations in policy caused by shifts in regime was a key component of many elites' personal family narratives and a key component of their rationale for their decision to engage in acts of extra-legality. Further, many of my informants views, viewed those who were able to avoid legal penalties as savvy and well-connected, while those who could not were, were regarded as politically inept and socially unconnected. In conclusion, these strategies employed by the elite actively exclude the broader population from the benefits of economic growth. They do this as it enables them to capture a much larger piece of the pie than a more even distribution of wealth would enable. Some economists or development practitioners like to say everybody wins from economic growth or everybody wins from inclusive economic growth, but that is not correct more people benefit from inclusive economic growth. The middle and lower classes certainly benefit, but the elites don't benefit from distributing the benefits of economic growth more broadly. The benefits of inclusive economic growth relate to the development of laws and policies that protect individual and group rights and create a level playing field for business to creating infrastructure like roads and public transport that enable regular people to travel more easily for work and education, and to the creation of things like quality government-funded schools and hospitals. Elites don't need these things. They have land rovers to bypass poor roads, funds to send their children to Etchison and Lums or abroad, and access to airlifts and hospitals in Dubai. Sharing wealth equitably reduces the extremity of their own wealth and curtails their ability to wield political power. So as they don't benefit from processes that distribute wealth and opportunity, processes like incorruptible legal systems, effective and proportional taxation focused on large business and taxing inheritance, and free quality education, they don't invest in these processes, and more than that, they undermine them. They undermine these systems by offering informal payments to legal clerks and judges, by sending threatening messages to watchdog institutions, as I talk about in the book with the case of the National Accountability Bureau, 
and by calling on favours to ensure their imports and exports are expedited and don't rot in the docks, rather than seeking to strengthen the customs system or develop a legal and governance system that can't be manipulated by each new regime in power. At the risk of ending my talk on a bleak note, I'll share one final point. Changing Pakistan so that it is no longer an elite-dominated state, but one in which everyone has access to quality education and healthcare and opportunity to develop businesses and careers, won't be led by the elite. As noted by the former principal of Etchison College, Shamim Khan, the goodies are too sweet and the incentives to maintain privilege are too powerful. Any change will come from those who have been excluded the people who stand to benefit from a more equitable distribution of wealth, power, and opportunity, and not from the families of the elite. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Armitage, for a wonderful, wonderful talk and a surprisingly um, comprehensive review of the book. Um, I have a couple of questions before we open the floor. Uh, number one, uh, I wanted to ask in what ways is the elite in Pakistan different from the global elite, but I think we've answered that question uh, quite in detail towards the end of your talk. Um, I also uh, want to uh, know your maybe insight uh, about how these uh, tightly knit networks might have undergone changes given the um, recent polariz political polarization in the um, country, maybe after you've done your fieldwork. Um, and uh, how do you think, uh, how much of this um, uh, political realm has its roots in the colonial history? Um, not just in terms of redistribution of wealth during the colonial times or uh, right after the colonial times, but also in terms of the sociology of power, um, in terms of how the non-elite um, or those outside these power structures respond to power and how much of this um, is um, or can be attributed to the colonial history? Well, I mean, I, I need to go and do a second round of research, I think, to see how things have changed in the last few years. But based on some conversations with um, elites I know and other political commentators, it does seem that there may have been a bit of a shift in the last few years in elite social spaces in terms of, as you mentioned, this political polarization which has emerged following Imran Khan's um, leadership and TTI. And I've been really interested in understanding you know, how that's changed. Because when I was um, was doing my research, I would attend these elite gatherings and there would be senior political leaders from each side of, from each political party. And they would be making jokes with each other. They would be critiquing each other's policies. They would be laughing, you know, during the day on television, they were fighting venomously. And then in the evening, it was all jokes, um, including with PTI supporters at that time. And from what I understand now is that polarization, um, particularly on the PTI supporter side and against the other more established political parties has created a, a quite significant divide where it is no longer um, acceptable or appropriate to joke around in the same way and where the tension is very heightened. A number of people have told me I um, yeah, I, I can't talk about politics with my friends on the other side anymore. You know, like we, we have to avoid this topic. We're still, friends. We're still friends, but we can't talk about those things. And that wasn't the case when when I did the majority of the research for this book. So I'm interested in, in learning a bit more about that, but that is a major shift that has occurred in the last eight years. Because that, that's definitely not something that I observed in 2014 and 15. Uh, I think your colonial origins question is, is harder. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure that I can do it justice. It'd be interesting to hear sort of more, more from you on, on, on your thoughts on that. Obviously, the way that um, the elites are structured and the established elite are structured as an enormous colonial legacy, which, you know, I talked about in this talk to a significant degree. And the places where you see that the most starkly are the um, the private clubs, particularly in Lahore and Karachi. I have never been anywhere more British, including England, <laughs> than those clubs. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. And the way people dress, the way they speak was like this epitome of Britishness. Um, and of course, schools like Etchison College, which is a very 
purposeful um, attempt to inculcate a certain set of values. And, you know, Shamim Khan and others who I spoke to with the principal, you know, they, they talk about in a very, very reflexive way, you know, these are the things that we teach mm. Um, in this school because we want to develop a certain kind of person and that builds straight out of the colonial legacy. I mean, it was a British school. So, um, but I think maybe you can comment more on on why other classes accept this, this stranglehold. <laughs> I'll have to introspect. And um, um, I, we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, that includes the audience who are uh, online. Maybe we'll take a um, few questions and you can respond to all of them once. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Umar Sadiq and I'm a senior research economist here. So it was a very nice presentation, a nice summing, uh, summing up of what has been happening in Pakistan for the last uh, 75 years. Uh, having said that, but isn't it so all over the world? I mean, uh, in every country, country, the elite find a way to keep their stranglehold on the uh, resources. Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, if you, uh, I'm sure you uh, must have read uh, Sam, Sam Bowles and Herb Gentis' work on uh, capitalist and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, schooling in uh, capitalist America. Mm -hmm. Although on the surface, it appears very egalitarian, but if you uh, look uh, deeper into it, they have formed the education system in a way that only the elite can, you know, uh, uh, extract the cream and of the uh, uh, of the pie. Secondly, uh, if you look at Thomas Piketty's work, he has also uh, said the same thing that capitalist uh, capitalism and capitalists try to, you know, uh, attract as much resources resources as possible. One can find, you know, a uh, uh, fault with his methodology. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism, but he, what he has shown is that uh, the wealth of the elite has, you know, exponentially grown and uh, the salaried class has, uh, uh, income has not grown as exponentially as uh, it has of the capitalist owners. And finally, if you look at uh, the, you know, the royalty of Europe, they have also done the same thing. I mean, Luxembourg, Spain, England, Denmark, Holland, uh, if I'm not wrong, they have also, you know, uh, 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 belong to the same family. So uh, in Pakistan, admittedly, it has hurt uh, more than uh, other countries. Uh, it is a small clique that, uh, you know, uh, enjoys the uh, benefit of a much smaller pie. But that is the inherent... Uh, quality you say or inherent uh, inherent uh, whatever you want to say of the uh, capitalism that only a few mm -hmm. are able to you know uh, attract the, uh, it towards themselves and uh, you know share the buy with a smaller group of people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can, can I can I actually answer before we go one by one? <laughs> it's like better to engage as we go. Thank you. That's um. A really good question and um and really important point i think that we can say that yes there are characteristics to the elite worldwide which are the same you can see this as you said you can see this in the us you can see it in australia where i am from you can see it in the uk elites will protect their privilege at any cost they will marry within that group they will socialize within that group they will be educated within that group and that's a very natural thing to want to maintain your power and your privilege but as i mentioned i think what is interesting about pakistan is that it's um, in some ways a, an exaggerated example of what happens with elites in other countries. Because the legal system is so porous, because it is so open to interference from each political regime, the protections for other business leaders or for middle class people, for anyone, are, are very weak. And I mean, and as I said, many of my informants would talk about this justification for their illegality or, or other kinds of behaviors because they felt that the state had preyed on them in various regimes. They had acquired a large amount of money and then it had all been taken away from them when a new regime came into power. So that makes Pakistan a bit unique in those ways. And there are other countries that have similar things, but also the... Um, 
enormous instability that I talked about does create um, a lot of opportunity for those who are willing to engage in risk in investing and in business making. So for those who have a tolerance for risk, um, they can make enormous profits which aren't available elsewhere. I think on the education system, um, that is it's very much the case. I think the US is one of the most unequal societies in the world. I and mean, if we look at the Gini coefficient, the US is, is right up there. So we have to be careful with not putting any of this in opposition to like the developed West. The US is not by any means a good practice example or anything that we should be aspiring to. The inequality is so deeply entrenched in their systems that it would be hard to break out of it, despite all the regulations and the laws that exist. And then I think just lastly, to your point about the natural outcomes of capitalism, I think um, we actually had an interesting conversation yesterday with, with Dr. Um, Nadeem Saab as well about what are, what are we looking for? Are we trying to eliminate inequality? And where I come to is we can't eliminate inequality. We can never, in, we can never eliminate it, right? Inequality of outcomes will never be achieved and it's foolhardy to try. But what we can ensure is a quality of opportunity. And that is something which isn't currently available in Pakistan. And it is something that the elites have a role in perpetuating. So if we go for that opportunity rather than the outcomes, I think we can be a little bit more productive. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Osman from CAS. Um, I have two questions, but I want to preface them by saying that as your friend, longstanding friend, I'm very proud of you <laughs> for this accomplishment and this monumental work. Um, my first question is that for your interview process, you looked at various groups, subgroups within the elites, the army, the bureaucracy, the private sector, and so on. So if you look at it in a group uh, level analysis, which group did you find for your interview process was the most forthcoming, most honest, most divulgent, mm -hmm. and which is the least forthcoming among them? The second question is, you made a very important point about self-reflexivity. We would in Urdu say, Ke inko they have no sensibility about what they do. Mm -hmm. So which of the groups did you find was the most self-reflective and which was the least self-reflective? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um Thank you, Osman, for asking that question, because it actually brings me to another key finding of the book. And this is one of the things that I discovered while I was doing. And I was focused on the business elite. And that was my, you know, my, my sample as an anthropologist. We focus on one small community and we delve into that community. But as I got into this research, it became completely apparent that there was no separate business elite, political elite, military elite they were entirely integrated. Mm -hmm. So when you ask that question, both of those questions, I couldn't actually say with a great deal of clarity mm -hmm. which was more forthcoming and which wasn't. When you look at their family trees, you can see that there are military connections all through the extended family. There are senior bureaucratic connections at certain points in their history, and there are political connections. And even within you know, one generation, like. People will talk about, you know, I, I encourage this son to go into the military. I encourage this son to go into politics. I encourage this one to run the family business. So actually, it's one group. We won't want this. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. And um, and in terms of how forthcoming, or I mean, so again, like there were families, like in, like nuclear families, which were more one or the other. Um, I should preface it by saying that I um, did not do any interviews with any mil like active military families. Um, it just was not a good idea to do that. So I did speak with retired generals and brigadiers, but I didn't speak with anyone who was in active military service. Um, but of course, all the families I spoke with had these connections. Um, and uh, of course, politicians are by their nature quite um, circumscribed, <laughs> not so, not not initially forthcoming. But I think um, as I, and the great thing about anthropology and ethnography is as you develop a relationship of trust with your subjects over time, they will feel comfortable in telling you things. And of course, it's fully anonymized. So I haven't used anybody's names and I never would. And they had trust in me that I would not be running around using their names when I talked about the research. But it took a long time with the politicians to establish that. Uh, hello, my name is Fatma. Hi, Rosita. Hi. Um, I don't know if this has been already answered. Um, so um, how are Pakistan's elites so different from the rest of the global elites? And what about us as pa I mean, Pakistan 
interested you so specifically to study us? <laughs> I don't know if you've already answered that. Uh, is it because, did you say is it because our legal system is so porous? Is it because of that? Well, I mean, in terms of what's different about the Pakistani elite, that is a big part of it. Like the porous legal system, the high levels of political instability, that's one of the big differences. There are many similarities with the global elite, many, but this creates like this exaggerated situation here. But maybe it's because our legal system is quite porous and we do it so poorly. I mean, I mean, but I feel as if maybe our legal system is porous, but people who are better at doing things, I feel other countries do it in a much more systematic matter mm. and we do it very i mean very very rough shot mm. other countries just have better ways of doing it they do the same things but just in a better more refined manner well yeah i mean i wouldn't use the word necessarily better or more refined but i think in if you, if you get what i'm trying to i say. think so I, I mean i think some other countries have a lot um they, their systems are much less flexible they're much less they're more impersonalized and they're more consistent, right? Like when you know, like if you're a businessman, what you want is a consistent impersonal legal system. Well, if you're at a certain level, because you you want to know what you're investing in, you want to know what the state will protect you from. You need that you need that consistency to engage in business um, successfully. If you're an elite businessman, you handle the risk. You have so much money that you can afford to risk it. You understand the state may be capricious; it may take it away from you in the next regime. All elites navigate their legal systems. I mean, that's what they do with like expensive tax lawyers, right? Like that. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Right, they right. Still get around the system, right? They just do it in a much more sophisticated right. manner. Right. No, I think that may be right, and and that's what I call extra legality, right? It's it's not illegal. It's not illegal if you find a tax loophole. It's not illegal, but it is against the intention of the law. The intention of the law is to tax everybody at a certain bracket. And if you have the right, if you have a certain amount of wealth, you are able to find where those holes are. Yeah. And, and of course, that happens all over the place. But there are many more safeguards in other contexts which um, provide some level of protection, which is less available here, I would say. Uh, and in terms of studying like just the, the Pakistani elites rather than other elites, I didn't go out to, I didn't set out to study the elites. I've always, um, I've had a close relationship with Pakistan for the last 20 years. I traveled here in 2001 and it's a place which is, I've always loved. Um, and so I decided to do my research on the Pakistani middle class and, um, and I was researching their aspirations because my friends were middle class. It was easy for me to understand. And then um, I met an elite person who started telling me about their business and I thought, this is so exciting and fascinating, and I want to understand it. Just quickly, I have not read your book, so I might come off as stupid, you know, but the question is regardless, uh, building on Umar's question, also the question from the Yet Fund, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that there are similarities between a global elite or elites in other countries and Pakistan elite. But, um, don't, do you think, and also I think you also alluded to that a little bit, that there are the basic, the basic, the business in which they do it, you know, here is a little bit more. Uh, and if that is true, if you think that what is the role of institutions? And I do realize institutions are not something that come out of a vacuum, you know, people are integral part of it. But formal institutions very easy to rationalize because people can infiltrate those, uh, those institutions. But what about informal institutions? And when I say informal institutions, uh, for me, something like, let's say, uh, general acceptance of uh, ethical degradation is also a form of an informal institution for me. And that in itself has more psychosocial um, explanations attached to it. So have you done research on that a little bit? So is, is there a question uh, about the significance of like, social values and acceptance of certain kinds of behavior? Yeah. And how uh, these can also uh, be foundations on which informal institutions are based and there is general acceptance within uh, the society at large not only within the elites society at large that this is standard practice okay right yeah thank you um i mean i think to some degree there is a general acceptance of these kind of behaviors and the way that things are changed just by sheer repetition over the years like the cyclical nature of 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 regime change and policy making and legal changes and um 
you know, investigations by the National Accountability Bureau and the FBR and these, these formal institutions have a really important role in investigating and curtailing abuses of power, um, but they've also been wielded as political tools by the regimes of the day. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to get into this question of, of why, why do people accept? Why do people accept this kind of behavior? I mean, I, I think there's a sense of helplessness and exhaustion that kicks in with regular people. Um, it, it feels like an insurmountable problem with it when there's no um, obvious solution to it. So I don't know if it's exactly acceptance, more weariness. Thank you again. Um, you touched upon the Bourdieuian lens of uh, symbolic capital, and one that I'm particularly fascinated by is the use of piety in our society. And I wonder in your observations of the elite gatherings, how much do they use their piety or their moral high ground to mask their activities, which may be extra legal, etc.? Like, how important was that? Mm. Did they say that they were like that and you saw a mismatch between mm. that, or did they just not bother with that? Huh. A yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, I think with many of the people, I mean, there were two different groups, right? The more established elites um, uh, were more relaxed in their piety <laughs> in private forums, like, I mean, things like acceptance of drinking alcohol, um, you know, it was very common, but that that kind of thing was very common. Um, and I mean, there were some notable exceptions, like um, during Ramzan, everybody stopped socializing. That was interesting. Everyone, because they, they couldn't drink. <laughs> so <laughs> they were asking though. They, uh, it's a good question. Some were and some weren't, but they all stopped drinking, which I thought was interesting. Um, I mean, amongst the people that I was watching at that moment, you know, that I was engaging with during Ramzan. So that was one moment of piety. And then there were other things like um, sometimes people would pull out a camera at an event and, and they'd take a nice photo, but then everyone would say, oh, stop. And then they would remove all the bottles <laughs> and put them under the table or around the side, and then they would have the photo. So maybe that's a little bit of the, in case the photo ever got distributed, there's not a bottle of whiskey sitting on the table. Um, and then, of course, there are other people like, um, like Malik Riaz and others who display their religiosity much more. I would say strategically, you know, a lot of press coverage of going on the Hajj and a lot of press coverage of, of big philanthropic donations to hospitals or to other places. Um, but, I mean, that isn't to say it isn't also felt. There was some, especially at the, at the tier below uh, what I was researching, there was some very um, genuinely religious and like mm -hmm. adherent business people that I met with who were um, yeah, much more pious in their daily activities, but that tended to be slightly below the level that I was looking at. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. And thank you so much, uh, Professor, for this. Uh, it was tremendous. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is on uh, dependency theory. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on how the sort of international global bureau bureaucracy sort of like, uh, what is their dynamics? And because Pakistan has always sort of functioned as a rentier economy, a large... Uh, a rentier economy so uh one of the ways one of the main ways they derive their sort of like wealth and so on is through sort of um but by, by sort of extracting resources from the global economy through international financial institutions donor agencies and so on and so what are your thoughts on that and my second question was on the idea of equality of opportunity um I don't think that that is necessarily um a sustainable sort of uh solution because uh and this is sort of we talked about class analysis and so the traditional Marxist perspective on this is that regardless of how much you sort of pursue democracy and you sort of democratize your institutions and you get rid of the pathologies and so on and so forth, you will still sort of see that inequality, it'll still sort of be bourgeois rule uh, in the final analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So do, do you see a sort of like um, um, a, a sort of horizon beyond that? So those are the, those are the two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Dependency theory and the rentier economy is, is quite outside of this research, but it is something um, I've also worked in international development for quite, quite a long time. Um, I mean, your question was broad. What do I think of it? Um, I mean, I think that foreign aid can be useful when well targeted and supporting 
good policies, good programs, I think it can also, of course, be a major source of funding to be siphoned off and extracted by, by groups who aren't going to use it for national development. So, I mean, without a more specific question, I don't think I can go too much more into that. I don't think, I think that international aid can be useful and has its place, but I agree that it is also often abused and wasted, um, which is, you know, enormously disappointing. Because the one approach that they could take for them is like they have to take these particularly mm. after the neoliberal period. They want to see that you're sort of following through on the prescriptions that they've assigned you and so on. Right. They can sort of go beyond that and also sort of push for dem the democratization of institutions and society at large. Lack of and how well has that gone <laughs> when the US has tried to do that? <laughs> right. I, I don't think that development aid is an effective way of changing the policy of another country. I think those kind of decisions have to be made as domestic by domestic policymakers. Um, with the support of domestic constituents. And I think when aid has been wielded as a political tool to progress a political agenda like democratization, it has not been at all successful. So I, I don't think aid is an effective political tool most of the time, yeah. as is my particular view. I still think it can be useful, but I think um, I, I wouldn't say that it is a decisive factor in shoring up elites power. I'm, I know that it contributes to individual wealth, that it is siphoned off by particular elites, but uh, I think it is probably less important than some people than some people argue. Uh, on the equality of opportunity, um, could you just repeat your question briefly? Yeah, I, I, just, uh, I thought that uh, if you're saying equality of opportunity, it's not exactly a sustainable solution. Mm -hmm. because inequality will continue to rise unless you do something about the fundamental structure of the economy in terms of the property rights and so forth. That's right. a traditional sort of right. Marxist argument. So right. you see a sort of rising beyond. A rise and beyond. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure again like I'm not sure where that request that question exactly goes, but I do think it is fundamentally important to ensure equality of opportunity and to make sure that there are institutions in place which allow that I mean a taxation system that works and redistributes certain amounts of wealth a public system which provides public services which are vital to the population like education I mean if if there is not a free quality education system it will be impossible to change the class structure there will not be any people who are able to like lead that shift in the class structure or work in the institutions which protect people's rights uh, so Again, I mean, I'm not sure what going beyond that would look like, but I, I do. Inequality will always exist, of course, but we can we can make it less unequal. We can make it less unequal by ensuring that people have basic things in place to participate in decision making forums and resource allocation. Uh, we have a question from Facebook um, because we're live on Facebook as well. It's, uh, for the. Um, online audience, I have to use this mic. Um, I wish they had elaborated on the question. It says, hi, uh, Dr. Armitage, fascinating talk. I have a methodology question. How did you distribute the elites across tiers? This is Azima Chima from Facebook. Ah, hi, Azima. <laughs> I know, Azima, nice to, nice to see you. Um, how did I differentiate them across tiers? Well, I mean, again, we talked at the beginning about how how is the elite defined, and and we talked about this a little yesterday. But I think it, it's a term which can be um, analytically unhelpful if you don't define it in a really tight way. So, as I said, I put a um, a structure on the group that I was looking at, which basically meant that they needed to be generating an income of, of over US $100 million a year. And that was like a precondition for me looking at these families closely. There were some families who are part of what you would might say the established elites who talked about, you know, we don't have anywhere near that level of wealth now. We actually lost a lot of it in, you know, in the war with, with Bangladesh. Um, but, but we have maintained our social networks. We've maintained these... Uh, um, these kind of cultural attributes, this cultural capital, and our children still go to the right elite schools. We still go to the right parties, but we don't have this income. So, million USD and above major elite. 
that was the definition that I used for inclusion in my study. So again, I'm not saying this is a universal definition because the term is extremely nebulous and it can be described, it can be explained in almost any way. So I had to put a parameter around my study. And so that was like the methodological parameter that I put in place because that was still quite a significant group in Pakistan. And of course, like I, I couldn't necessarily get into the details of their you know, of their, 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 their wealth and their holdings, but I could see from speaking with different people that they had over that amount coming in. And it was enough people that I could still do interesting research with them. There's some tearing and leering where, where, where you're uh, talking about, and I think this is the very onset of your book, the cigarette analogy that you're looking mm. at the motives that gives you about how to, you know, the, there are ways to divide people across. Groups right, groups right. And again, that comes back to how do you define it an elite? Like that, 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 that analogy I use at the beginning of the book is something that like a sociologist might use, you know, like uh, middle class people are the people who spend this kind of money on these kind of items. Uh, upper class people are the kinds of people who spend this kind of money on, on these kind of items. I mean, as an anthropologist, I, I think that spending, con like spending habits uh, interesting and useful, but limited, um, and that it's more interesting to look at these other kinds of more invisible things. More like, right. But I mean, owning a certain amount of wealth is also a precondition, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Because really it comes down to what is privilege, right? And, and being elite is about having privilege. And if you want to have, you know, if, if you have an enormous amount of privilege, you have power and you also have income. And I mean, when I say power, decision-making power. Uh, we'll take one last question and then we'll call it today. Uh, hi, Rosita. Uh, I'm Sumaila Igar and with my friends from Bali. And thank you, first of all, thank you so much for the lovely book. My question is about uh, like your, like your field work, your research, your ethnography. Uh, during this work, you, uh, of course, uh, went to women of the elite class. So, uh, in your opinion, how these women are different from the middle class in Pakistan mm -hmm. in terms of this resource ownership and this capital uh, when we are talking about the, the ownership and the decision making. Hmm. That's an interesting question, and it's one that I would have liked to have done more research on directly. Most of my research was with men, and then there was a smaller group of women that I formed friendships with and relationships with. Uh, by and large, I, it's easier for me to answer what is the difference between an elite woman and an elite man than it is for me to describe the difference between a middle class woman and an elite woman. Uh, I mean, the difference with elite men and women is they had much less decision-making authority within the family. Um, they were still, they were given fewer freedoms than the men in their family, you know, particularly in terms of, you know, where can you go to university? The son might go to the U S the daughter would maybe stay in lums near, nearby to the house mm -hmm. in Lahore. There were like other, you know, things about keeping mm -hmm. the girls in the family close and, mm -hmm. and looking after them to a greater degree. Mm -hmm. A lot of the women in this class, um, didn't have active decision-making roles in the family businesses, but they had um, like side projects like clothing boutiques, um, like bit small businesses, often around fashion, not always, but often around fashion. Um, I The difference with middle-class women, again, that's a question I haven't looked at. It's a very interesting one. And it would probably depend on which part of the elite the women were from, whether it was the established elite or the newer elite, um, because some of the elite women in this study um, were very conservative, were very religious, in opposition to their husbands and at times, um, whereas a lot of middle class Pakistani women I know, um, I mean, they may be, may be religious, they may be less religious, but they have a great deal of independence they have a great deal of um, autonomy in their education and their careers um, and I saw that less among elite women they were they were more shielded and they had less independent lives in the very limited sample that I looked at so that's something which requires more research for a proper answer thank you thank you so much professor Amtaj um uh, for your for a very fascinating talk and thank you so much for coming to Pakistan and for for your research for your book. We are looking forward to um, hearing more from you. You know on the follow up question that we've been discussing <laughs> since yesterday. Great. So um, it was a lovely interaction and uh, thank you from my side and from Pied. Um,
this is it. Let's call it a day. Huh? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.